Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to episode two of Grape Choice Wine Reviews. I'm your host, Raphael Peterson. Um, please, before we get into this, just take a moment, do me a huge favor if you would, just go to uh, the YouTube channel under Hospitality TV, just like hospitality, except exchange the V for the Y at the end of the word. Um, that's my channel, Hospitality TV. You'll find me on YouTube, so please subscribe there. All these videos will go there. And then, of course, please follow me on Instagram, Hospitality TV, where I put a bunch of content related uh, to the wine world and to my daily job as a sommelier. So we're coming back with episode two. Thank you so much for everyone's feedback on episode one. I uh, just released it. Uh, yesterday and got a lot of really good feedback and some great comments. So a lot of people sharing that. Uh, I really appreciate you. So thank you for doing that. So episode two, uh, the idea today was to go back to Vons, back to the supermarket, check out some new wines. Um, I was going to make some super simple pork tacos tonight. I want to preface this with saying I am I'm by no means uh, any type of chef, nor am I qualified to be doing any type of cooking of such nature. Um, but I do have to feed myself and I'm going to make some basic dishes. So I'm thinking, all right, pork tacos with a little mango chutney, something super easy. Um, I'm thinking a lighter style of red. So I'm thinking Pinot Noir uh, to go with my dinner tonight. Um, so if you're in the mood for Pinot Noir and you're thinking that, well, the idea is too to try to explore into some different styles of wine, right? So what are some wines that are similar to Pinot Noir? We talked a little bit about this in the first episode, um, but other thin skin grapes, right? So Pinot Noir, Gamay is a grape that's very similar to Pinot Noir grown in the southern part of Burgundy. We have Sangiovese, which is the grape in Chianti. Nebbiolo, which is the grape that produces Barolo and Barbaresco and kind of Longay style of wines. This is from Piedmont, Northwestern Italy, um, right? And this, those are basically your five grapes of thin skin grapes. So I went out to the supermarket to try to look for Pinot and then some alternatives to Pinot. I went live at the supermarket in the aisle where they sell the wines. It was super awkward. I don't think I need to do that again anytime soon. Uh, definitely not enjoyable. Yeah, I don't know. Speaking to a phone in the middle of the grocery aisle was uh, pretty weird. And not to mention I have a mask on. It's just all weird in there. There was an associate there who was, um, you know, seemed a little interested in what I was doing, but not in a good way. Um, and then when she realized that I was live, she actually went running away. So super awkward for everybody involved. Don't need to do that anytime soon. Um, so I think that if you have any type of wine questions or some things uh, that you think I should explore, like certain grape varieties or other things like that, please let me know and we can do that um, through the channel. So a quick note on, um, you know, when you're shopping for wines at the supermarket, again, if I'm thinking something lighter in style, something like Pinot Noir or alternatives like we're going to talk about today, if you go through the aisle, right there, first of all, there wasn't a ton of options under 15 bucks at the Vons and Pacific Beach. So you know, I'm going to be ripping through some of those wines, but we might have to look, start looking for some other places here soon, which was the whole idea anyway. Um, but very limited options for Pinot Noir, you know, under 15 bucks or like, uh, you know, grapes that are similar to Pinot Noir. When you're looking at some of the labels, I just want to help to kind of, you know, differentiate again. You want to look for these grapes that we just discussed. They're going to be on the lighter side. If you start veering into red blends, just the word there, those are normally going to be on the richer side. You don't see a lot of domestic red blends of lighter thin skin grapes. For the most part, these are made um, in a richer, bolder style with sweeter fruit, honestly, for the most part, what is what I've encountered for red blends. So just a note on that, if you're kind of veering into red blends, you're probably gonna end up with a richer style of wine. Again, just depends what you're in the mood for that day. So some of the wines that I got today, we got the Pinot Noir. This is one of the few ones, you know, there's a there's about a half dozen that I saw that were under, you know, 15. Um, there may be a little bit more, but I was live on Instagram and it was super weird and I just want to get the hell out of there. So I made it quick. So the first one that I got is Rascal Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, the second one is a Gamay from Louis Jetto. It is Beaujolais Village. So very similar grape to Pinot Noir, very identical. Um, next one up is Sangiovese, right? This is going to be a Chianti Classico from Gaviano. And then the last one is a Cote de Rhone, uh, from Guy Gal. This is, we, t we reviewed a Cote de Rhone last week in the first episode, uh, just in kind of a note on this actually, we were talking about how Cote de Rhone is an appellation in the Southern Rhone Valley where they're typically Grenache based blends with Suma uh, Syrah and Mouvet, excuse me, and a, uh, a bunch of other grapes that are allowed to be blended into the area, right? So the wine that we bought last week was Famille Perrine, it was a Grenache based blend. And as I'm looking for another Grenache here to go along with my thin skin grapes, I grabbed this kind of hastily, not knowing that Guy Gal is knowing 
or is known for using higher proportions of Syrah in their Cote de Rhone. There's no way you would know that. The grapes aren't listed on the back of the, um, of the label. So it makes it kind of tricky, right? One way though you can see to if you're still in this kind of thin skin slash lighter wine category is to check the alcohol, the ABV in the wine. That should always be listed. And on this bottle, it is 14.5%. So even though I was looking for a richer wine tonight, I kind of made a quick decision. Oh, excuse me, I was looking for a lighter wine tonight and I kind of made a quick decision. And I think that this actually might be a little bit richer than I was looking for. But that's how it goes and that's how you learn, right? So let's start off with the first wine of the evening, Rascal Pinot Noir. So this is out of Oregon. If we look at the label, it says Oregon Pinot Noir, right? So pretty generic labeling. Remember that if the smaller the location where the wine comes from, supposedly it should be of a better quality because you're getting more typicity from the region where it comes from, smaller production in theory. Um, the laws of production in the states are pretty loose, right? Especially if you compare them to the regulations put in, pla in place for France or Italy or Spain, any of these other you know, Central European regions where it's much stricter. Um, you know, the, the, the laws in the States don't really tell you a whole lot, but we do know that, you know, as an Oregon Appalachian, I mean, they're getting wine from, they're getting grapes from all over the place to make this wine. So, um, very big Appalachian, uh, says Pinot Noir, the proud supporter of the Humane Society of the United States. Um, cool. So that's kind of why this wine got me. The choices were very limited for uh, Pinot Noir for 15 bucks and under. Um, and these guys are supposedly um, supporting humane societies. Um, and dog lovers with a little picture of the dog here on the label. I love dogs. They kind of got me with the label and there wasn't a lot of options. So let's see what is going on here. Oregon Pinot Noir, you know, I always kind of look at it as a nice in-between place between California Pinot Noir, given that that will be somewhat of a fruitier style and Burgundian Pinot Noir, slightly on the earthier side. Oregon, for me, kind of always tends to fall in between those two. <clears throat> I know it's a gross generalization, but it's an easy way to kind of look at the things. Of course, the styles will depend from producer to producer. So this is a thin skin grape that is a lighter style of wine. I can definitely see through it. This, by the way, is clocking in at 13.5% alcohol. Um, let's give it a whiff and see what we have going on. I don't worry about too much about the legs or anything like that. I mean, honestly, it's, I don't think that tells me too much, me personally. But the nose, for sure, I'm always interested. This smells like Pinot, it, it, meaning that it is very aromatic. You get a lot of red flowers. A um, little, bit, little bit of bacon spice in here, but very red fruit driven, which is characteristic of a lot of Pinot Noir. I'll give it a taste. So this wine is pretty light on the palate. Um, it is, again, very red fruit forward, just like on the nose, you get a lot of kind of drier fruit actually, um, as it starts to finish out. You get a lot of drier strawberry, drier cranberry notes that come through. Um, it's kind of like a dry, dusty tannin. So the tannins are there. They're not very elevated, but it finishes with a drier um, tannic finish versus some Pinots might finish with fruit or things like this. Um, a little bit of baking spice, you know, nothing too crazy. The wine is very simple, very straightforward. Um, I mean, it's an easy, crushable wine. This one we bought for $12.21 at Vons. So, you know, other Pinots in this category, like Mark West Pinot Noir, could give that a whirl next, next week. Yeah, pretty straightforward, light body, red fruit driven, nothing too impressive about this wine. Um, again, I think it finishes with a little kind of drier, somewhat bitter finish on the end, um, which, um, you know, again, it's a crushable wine, but nothing too interesting here. Um, so for this wine, I'm going to give it an 80, three out of a hundred. I don't need to rush and buy this wine anytime soon, um, which is unfortunate. But again, this is why we're doing this because we want to provide alternatives, right? This one is 1221. These other wines are clocking in, um, around the same price point and they're from other regions. Um, I, 
was looking, like I said earlier, I was looking for a Grenache and I went with this Cote de Rhone because normally they're Grenache driven, even though this is Syrah. What I was surprised is that currently at the Vons over here, there wasn't any Garnacha, which is always my go-to Spanish Garnacha. Um, you tend to get a lot of value from Spain um, just across the board. And Spanish Garnacha, you can normally find some 10, 11, 12 bucks that'll blow you away. I actually used to buy one there called uh, Las Frocas. Again, super entry level, but if you're looking for something easy, young, fruity, and just fun, kind of dynamic, has some spicy notes and things like this to it, that one was killer, but couldn't find any at the store. So no Spanish Garnacha, unfortunately, in this episode. Um, but what are you gonna do? We're gonna move forward. So Beaujolais Village. So Louis Jadot, right? So a lot to be said about this. Um, no sommelier probably would be caught dead drinking these wines just because you see them everywhere in every supermarket, which is great for them. They have, you know, a lot of market dominance for what they do. They clock in at, you know, they're coming pretty close to a million cases a year in production. They are a negotiant, meaning that they buy fruit from all over the place. And we're speaking within Burgundy here, sorry. And they make wines from fruit that they buy. So it's not all estate driven. Again, is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily. There's a lot of really great negotiants that make great wine. Um, is there anything wrong with the mass production of wine? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I don't think so. That's what we're here to do this show is to be able to taste these wines objectively and get to the bottom of that, right? And to try to take away any preface or any type of judgment I might have on this wine because it's a big producer that you see in every damn supermarket that you walk into and it's not cool because it's a mass produced wine and I need to find something that's trendy and cool and small production that nobody knows about in order for me to enjoy it. Well, I'm trying to get rid of that stigma around wine, right? Of, of course, it's cool to try new, cool, hip things and kind of be on something that not a lot of people know about, but at the same time, I want to taste the wine for what it is and how it tastes, right? So. This is coming from the southern part of Burgundy, from the area known as Beaujolais. You might see this um, in most supermarkets that you go to. This is a step up from Beaujolais Nouveau, which is um, comes out in around October. It's a very festive style of wine. It's always bottled extremely young within the same year, typically, um, in which it's harvested and then released very young, right? Um, so a step up from that is Beaujolais Village which is coming from the southern part of the area of Beaujolais. And then a step up from Beaujolais Village, which is this, are the Cru Beaujolais, which are smaller areas of production within Beaujolais, right? So this is right in the middle. Um, Beaujolais Village, something to know about this wine in particular. Um, Beaujolais, the style of wine that comes from this area, um, there's a style of production that's associated with it, and it's called carbonic maceration, right? So a lot of Beaujolais Nouveau is done in this style. Um, and what it does is it creates a wine that it's intensely fruity, but it has these very intense bubblegum flavors and banana flavors, like banana starburst, if you've had that combined with bubblegum, big league chew, like it's pretty wild. And it has this like real pop of fruit that comes out of it that is like, it's a giveaway if you're ever tasting wine blind for Beaujolais, like it just pops right out of the glass. So something to consider that this wine does not have, it is not produced in that way of carbonic maceration. Um, now again, Gamay, it does actually list the grape on here, which is not necessarily usual for European wines. But of course, what they do is this is, you know, brought out here for the American market, so they do so well with it. It says 100% Gamay here on the back. Alcohol is clocking in at 13%, which is on the lighter side. Let's talk about that for a second. Alcohol, again, we talked about it a little bit with this guy, but if you're trying, you can, you can measure the richness of the wine with the alcohol content, right? So if it's 13 and under, you should be expecting a light bodied wine. You know, if you went from 13.5 to 14.5, it's fair to say it's probably being the medium bodied and then 14.5% and up, you're looking at a full big rich wine, right? They go kind of hand in hand. So it's just something to consider. This one looks a little darker for sure compared to the Rascal Oregon Pinot Noir. I can just barely see through it, um, but it looks a touch denser than the Pinot that we just drank. So very soft aromatics. There's um, again, Pinot Noir or Gamay, excuse me, you know, very red fruit driven, but there's like a creaminess to this wine, right? kind of makes it a very smooth, kind of fresh flower, flesh, uh, fresh rose component to the wine. 
nothing too crazy else coming out of it. Let's uh, let's give it a taste. It's funny, it's only 13% alcohol, but I can feel the heat on the wine. Um, and the tannin structure is dry and it lingers a lot. Which, again, you'd expect out of Burgundy, right? That's always the difference, except, especially when you're talking about the difference between New World wines, aka California, Oregon, and Old World wines, aka Central Europe, France, Italy, Spain, Germany. Is that how does the wine finish, right? Is it fruit dominant and finishes with a fruity aftertaste? Or is it, or is there a presence of a lot of minerality and secondary aromas and baking spices and earthiness and things like this? And does it finish dry? Uh, and this definitely has a drier finish to it. It has a really nice ripe raspberry, ripe cherry, ripe kind of bright strawberry fruit up front. It has pretty good weight on the palate. Um, it has a nice kind of drier finish. It's pretty simple, um, but you know, I'm not mad at it. Again, for what it is, this one clocks in at $14.43 for the Beaujolais Village. Um, and again, these guys, you know, I know people rag on it because it's such a big producer, um, but they have some very high end bottlings as well. I mean, they, they do have some estate properties where they make wines from all their own estate fruit, um, some really cool Grand Cru's, expensive stuff that they make wine out of, um, that a lot of people think is really great. So I think it's interesting for, to see kind of what their entry level, uh, wines can do. I'm not mad at the wine. It's not a bad wine. I kind of like that it's not <clears throat> so bubblegummy and banana flavors that you get from carbonic maceration because they don't do that in this wine. Uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty easy, easy drinking. It does, it's kind of pushing our boundaries right at 15 bucks. So for 14.43, again, we're getting the most bang for our buck. I think it's pretty, I think it's a pretty nice Pinot. It's not super dry. I'm, I'm gonna ex expect that this Chianti Classico is gonna finish much drier um, than this guy, right? So I think it's still uh, something that if you're weary about having wines that are too dry, I don't think you should be scared about this one. It's not gonna, it's not gonna rip your face off with these dry tannins. I think it's still very approachable. I'm going to give that an 85 out of 100. I would drink that again for sure. I would buy that again. Um, you know, if that was kind of in my wheelhouse of what I was expecting to, to have for that night for $15 and under for something like Pinot Noir. Um, Again, not mad at it, but pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Let's move on. All right. I am a sucker for Italian wines, so I'm kind of excited to try this. Uh, this is one of the larger producers of Chianti <clears throat> out there, period. So we'll have to see how it delivers taste-wise, right? All right, so this wine is... Gabbiano Chianti Classico 2017. The label is Cavaliere de Oro, means the golden knight. So Gabbiano apparently was established in the 1400s in Tuscany, which is insane. And which is part of the reason why I love old world wines because they come packed with so much history. That's nuts. So in the 1400s, so during the middle ages where the castle was built here, where this property is, supposedly the, the legend goes that there was a golden knight that would protect the property, would protect the Castello. Um, and so they made this label, the Cavaliere de Oro, in kind of honoring the memory of that golden knight, which I think is pretty cool. So again, Chianti Classico, this is gonna be Sangiovese dominant. Again, remember, thin skin grape. We can expect this to hopefully be on par in body with some of these other lighter varietals that we have going on. So let's pour a little bit here. I'm excited for this one. Love my Italian wine. Looks a little darker. Yeah, the nose is way different also. So you get this very uh, kind of stewed red fruit component. So remember, we're thinking more developed, more concentrated red fruit. Not from concentrate, but just more concentration in the fruit. 
there is a kind of leafiness which I which I like about this and can very be very typical for wines of Chianti. So you have this, you think about like a lot of times if you're picking grapes and you know some of those grapes are on the stems and you throw them into like these big buckets and you take them to the winery and then you crush and ferment them all together. There's there's going to be a stemminess involved. That's what I mean if I say stemminess or kind of a twiggy note to the wine because I'm I'm it makes me remember, it makes me think about as if some of those grapes were still on some of the stems that they're that they're coming off of versus actually picking those grapes off and maybe using some type of technology to make sure that you're only getting grapes in there right um it's just something to consider but i'm getting that on the nose there's this apart from the very stewed red fruit that's coming through i'm getting like a twigginess a stemminess there's an earthiness like a fresh potting soil that's coming through in this wine a little leather here, a little clay-like minerality as well. Super interesting on the nose. Um, also smells kind of like tomato paste or stewed tomatoes. Super interesting. All right, let's give it a whirl. Whoops, that was a close one. All right. So as I expected, you know, a lot of stewed fruit on the nose, but on the palate, it finishes much drier and more tart fruit flavors. So again, very typical for, young, for Chianti, you have this drier cherry, dry, tart red fruit component that finishes on the wine. Um, but you do have these beautiful baking spices and dried um, kind of leather and pepper notes that come through on the back end of the wine that I like a lot. It is very light body too. I mean, this is, let's see what the alcohol is on this. 13.5% um, alcohol. Yeah, this is definitely on the lighter side of medium, right? Like kind of medium minus in body. Um, very comparable in body to these first two wines, um, which is why we categorize them together as thin skin grapes. Um, but again, in comparison to these, there's definitely a lot more spice notes coming through. There's a bit more of this kind of tobacco tar, fresh potting soil that comes through, even though those there's a little bit lighter. They're not as dominant as the fruit, um, but there's a lot of balance between those fruity notes and the spicy notes in this wine. Um, I gotta say, I'm just a big sucker for Chianti. This is a great everyday drinking wine because I think that it delivers a little bit more than just straight up fruit notes um, in your glass. This wine, let's see what the price point is, $13.32. Um, so pretty banging wine, I think, for the price. I would totally buy that again. It is a little bit drier than the first two, so, and it does have a lot of acidity, right? I think a lot of times what happens in Chianti Classico is that you have kind of drier tannins, and it is very much driven by acidity. Um, but not coming across as an acidic wine or an out of balance acidic wine at all. Um, and if you do have wines like this that have a little bit more tannin and acidity, it makes them great food wines, right? So anything, this would probably go great with the little pork chop tacos I'm about to fire off here or anything that, um, anything that you have on deck that's a kind of a lighter dish, right? I think this will go very well with that. Um, this wine I would buy again. It's not you know, a showstopper, but it is, I think, kind of hitting the mark for what a classic Chianti should be. Definitely showing some typicity with that drier fruit, subtle earthy tones, higher acidity, higher minerality, all packed into kind of a lighter, sleek, elegant body. Um, I'm all about that wine. I'm gonna give it an 88 out of 100 for the Gabbiano Chianti Classico. All right, moving on to the final wine. So. Giga, we were talking about this at the beginning of the show. Um, Cote de Rhone in, in that it is a blend, right? A GSM, Grenache Ram Mouved. Typically, Cote de Rhone's will be Grenache dominant, but the Giga is a unusually high proportion of Syrah in the blend with 50% Syrah up front, 14.5% alcohol. This is probably a richer style. I apologize again, it's not a fair comparison to throw these in here if I'm looking for a lighter style of wine because the Syrah dominance in here, it is a thick skinned grape. It's gonna make the wine a little bit darker and opaque like we can already see and 14.5% alcohol, right? Now there is Grenache and Mouvet in this so I'm not expecting this to be 
so rich that now it falls into the camp of Cabernet Merlot and like these other bigger, richer varieties. Um, but it's somewhere in the middle there, right? So we're getting this really intense, darker red fruit. So black cherry, pomegranate, darker cranberry, black pepper. I feel like I say that a lot with red wines. It's just, I, I like it when it comes out. It's definitely a component that can come through in a lot of these red wines. Um, there's like a red licorice, black licorice component to this wine as well. Almost kind of like a subtle menthol note. It's kind of, kind of strange. Not a bad thing, just interesting. Um, let's give it a whirl. Yeah, there's a lot going on to this wine. Higher viscosity, definitely a little bit richer. It coats, it coats the palate much more than the first three. The tannins are there. Uh, definitely finishes with the tannin. I like it a lot though. It's, you know, with Syrah, a lot of times, sometimes some of the characteristics is you get blue and black fruit more with Syrah. This is still very red fruit driven. I think it's because it does have the Grenache to kind of balance it out. Um, it is... Um, with the Syrah, again, sometimes you get this olivey note, kind of a black olive, green olive, little briny note. I know it kind of sounds a little weird for, for wine, but it's more something that we refer to as savory, right? It adds another element. Again, things like this, they make very good food pairings when you have these food elements in the wine. Um, classic two Syrah, kind of these gamey notes, a little dried kind of beef jerky in there, although it's very subtle. Um, this is a great wine. Again, this is one of those wines made by an amazing producer. I mean, not I don't think as big in production as Louis Jadot, actually definitely not. But again, a negotiant, meaning that they buy fruit from all over the place and they make wine and put their label on it. So it's not all estate produced. Is that a bad thing? I mean, no, right? They employ a lot of people. There's a lot of good things that come with that. And if you can make wine that's typical of the region or that provides typicity of the region where it comes from, I think it's a great thing. I think this is a killer Cote de Rhone. Again, I'm a sucker for Syrah, but this is very well balanced. Um, it is a little bit richer and weightier than the Cote de Rhone we reviewed last week, the Famille Perrine Cote de Rhone, which was 11 bucks, I think. A little bit lighter. You know, it, it's actually, I should say, excuse me. I remember that wine. It did surprise us. It was a little bit weighter than I expected it to be. But, you know, and this is kind of the same thing. This is a richer style of Cote de Rhone. Uh, it's going to be a bit richer than these three. But again, I think still in the medium bodied camp and down. So not a far stretch from these wines. And again, for 14 bucks in the same price point, you're coming across with a, um, a wine that has kind of these spicier notes, more gamey notes. If you're thinking meat or cured meat or anything, any richer proteins that you're dealing with for dinner, uh, this would be a really great pairing with that. So for this Guy Gal Cote de Rhone, I'm gonna give it an 89. Oh, I'm going to give it a 90. I like that wine a lot. I'm going to give it a 90 out of 100. I'll definitely drink it again. And I would love to share it with some friends. So that's the show for today, guys. Please let me know if you have any questions. Again, thanks for your support so far um, with these wine reviews. I'm open to any suggestions that you have. If you guys have any themes or things like this, um, I have a couple collaborations in the works too. of some things that we're going to be moving forward with, some chef pairings and things like this. So um, I'm really happy for what's to come. Again, thanks for the support. Let me know what you guys think and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.